This is an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. Louis Ferrante is back on the show. He's a former mobster and author of such books as Mob Rules. His latest book is the first entry in a three-volume series called Borgata, Rise of Empire, A History of the American Mafia, and it chronicles the rise of Italian organized crime. Lewis joins us via Zoom from Florida. Hi, Lewis. How are you, Peter? Great to talk to you. Just tickety-boo. Nice to have you back on the program once again. It was always a pleasure talking to you back in the day. And one of the questions I asked you in the previous conversation was, and you said you were no squealer, the fact that you were writing books that dealt with the mafia when, and you were once part of it, that probably didn't go well with the people you used to work with and for. So I'm just wondering, with this new three-book series that you're doing, is that no longer a concern or is it still a concern? Uh, so it's it's a great question, and it's no longer a concern because things have changed. And because I never cooperated and I never informed on my fellow associates, former associates, I should say more accurately, they're fine with me. I bump into them. I still go back to Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island. I bump into people I used to be on the streets with who are still active in that life, and they're happy to see me. They know that I kept my mouth shut when my, you know, when my feet were to the fire, and they have no problem with me writing books so far because I'm not outing them as far as any crimes are concerned. I'm not causing them any problems. I'm writing basically about the history of the mafia, and the latest entry takes place in 1860s Sicily up and through 1960 America. Second volume is 1960 to 1980. And the third volume will go to about 2005, which is when I got out of prison in 2003. But 2005 is when the last of the central figures in volume three sort of exit the stage. And things have changed since then. They're no longer killing. I don't know how a mafia could exist without killing people, but they are no longer killing to the best of their ability. They haven't been killing. And things have changed. They just, uh, with all the squealers and foremans that are out there, they're fine with me because they know I never put anyone in jail. And now there are just like literally dozens of people all over the internet who have squealed and continue to talk about what they did and who they squealed on. And those are sort of like thorns in their side, those people, whereas I'm not. Okay, so let's talk about the the book series that you're currently doing. And again, you're doing it in a three part book series. Was this always your intent to do that? And tell us what the first one is about. No, it was not my intent. I was visiting Sicily. I was invited there by a, a German media conglomerate. They were having an editor retreat in Sicily for all the different editors throughout uh, Eastern Europe that the uh, Western and Eastern Europe that the these German uh, conglomerate sort of like controlled and owned. And I was there and I met Lord George Weidenfeld, the late Lord George Weidenfeld, who was a huge publisher, one of the most preeminent publishers of the 20th century. And we struck a we struck up a great conversation. We we became friends. And he said to me, I'd love to publish your next book. And I said, and what might that be? And he said, why don't you write a history of the mafia? No better person than you, someone who's lived it and someone who's educated himself and can write about it. So I did take on that task and it morphed into a trilogy. I never thought it would. It was supposed to be one book, but um, I just kept writing and there was so much information to, to put out there that I wanted the reader to understand and to know about the formation and origins of the mafia up and through its heyday and its fall. So I do The Rise of Empire, which is volume one, Clash of Titans, which is when all of the major forces between organized crime fight within themselves and also to fight major people of the un- of the overworld, like U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. I cover the, U- the uh, Kennedy assassination thoroughly uh, with new arguments, angles, and evidence. And then I do Autumn of Empire, which is sort of like how the mafia has fallen away from what it used to be. But it morphed into a trilogy. It was not something I had anticipated from the beginning. And it's just something that happened. And it took me the better part of seven or eight years now. I've been going at it. By the time volume three is finished, uh, I'm finished editing it. It's released. It'll probably be closer to a decade. Wow. Now, you have the background. You worked in the mafia. You, uh, You went to jail because of it. You have a knowledge of what it is to be in the mafia, and I'm sure you had a history of its origins as well. But in doing the books, what have you learned? What what surprised you in doing your research to cover this story? I learned so much, Peter, and that's such a great question because you would never think that if you're going into it as an historian and you know about the mob, you feel like, yeah, I probably know a lot of this and 
there was so much I didn't know. And I connected the dots um, in so many places where I found something to be a myth and I debunked it. And then we connect the dots as to how this myth arose and why it probably arose and what the truth was likely. And I bring the reader along in this journey where I'm basically telling the reader, I'm not going to tell you this is fake because I'm the expert. I'm going to explain to you why it could never have happened. And I debunked a lot of long held mafia myths that I found to be sort of like time stamped. For example, if I would trace, let's say, a myth to a publication in major newspaper, maybe a journalist speculating in 1935 about Lucky Luciano, just for example. And that journalist then was taken quite literally when the journalist maybe was specifically saying, I'm just speculating here, but this might have happened. Then a historian comes along and says, well, this is what happened. And then another historian cites that first historian and the third one cites the first two. And then through time over the decades, it becomes just like the truth, quote unquote, the truth. And then I would go back and I would say, there's no way Lucky Luciano did that. There's no way any mobster that I ever knew would have acted in such a way. And this is why. And I break it down. So the reader comes along with me on a journey and begins to think like a mobster thinks so that they understand this is why Lucky Luciano would have never done this. And it would have cost him his life if he did do it. And then I break it down for the, for the reader. And then I also go on to say, this is probably the likely scenario. And so far, the overwhelming response has been incredibly positive to that, where readers feel like they're not only just reading history, but they're along for a ride, along for a journey. I wanted the reader to understand exactly how mafiosos think and go about their day and go and their thought processes behind certain things that they do. So that reader can then take that with them as they read maybe the next book or two about the mafia. They'll have an instinct, where an, uh, an intuitive sense of what, what is real and what's, what's not when they read. And I feel like that was the main thing that I really wanted to do, in especially the older history, where a lot of myths popped up. I debunk those myths, and I not only tell you that this is false, but I explain to the reader why it could never have happened. And there's been an overwhelmingly positive response to that from many of my readers who said, gee, I felt like a mobster myself because you explained to me exactly how to think like a mobster. And, you know, this is the first book that actually did that for me, where I've read so many histories and they just regurgitate a lot of the old stories. And this was the first one that took a, an analytical look at those same stories and said, well, this probably happened, but this might not have. This probably happened, but this could not have. And I'm, I was the first to have done that. And I'm, that's, that's one of the proudest things I think that I've done in this history was, uh, you know, give you, give you the truth as, the, as, as best as I could see it and assess it. Well, let's go to the first book in particular and talk about the rise of the empire, basically. What was it mm -hmm. that led American version of the mafia to grow the way it did, what was the nucleus? There was a confluence of different events that only fate could have created. For example, when the mafia was first beginning in the United States, it was a lot of Italians, Southern Italians mostly, who came from very poor places in Southern Italy, as opposed to Northern Italy, where the, the centers of commerce and culture were a lot, a lot closer to Western Europe. Uh, Southern Italy had supposedly, or, or uh, evidently, I should say, been left behind for, for decades, if not centuries. And the Southern Italians were coming here poor and they formed their own organization. And a lot of them were killing each other and doing uh, dirty deeds, extorting other Italians. And they weren't looked at as anything romantic or sexy as we might look at the mafia today. They were just, you know, a bunch of quote unquote barbarians, you know, running around the streets of America, wherever they landed and killing each other. And they weren't thought of as anything more than just like a problem, a, a scourge to society. And at some point or another, there were a number of events, for example, the first one being prohibition. When Americans were deprived of alcohol through prohibition, the mafia stepped into the vacuum and said, we could give the people what they want by providing them alcohol at a time when they feel the government is treating them like children who aren't allowed to drink. So the mafia started to provide all of these bootlegging outlets to the public. And a lot of that alcohol was made, homemade in the United States. And a lot of it was also brought in from countries like the UK or Canada. And a lot of these of this liquor was then being distributed throughout the country. And people were saying, gee, if the mafia is providing us with all this alcohol and the government won't give it to us, maybe the mafia isn't so bad. So they started to get sort of this like sex appeal at that time. And also, too, they opened speakeasies, you know, where you could come in there and you could have this nice 
atmosphere and have a drink. And also women who were chained to domestic roles for, for centuries, if, if not throughout history, from the beginning of history, recorded history, women were chained to domestic roles. For the first time, women were starting to, to get out of the house and they were going to speakeasies where they could drink like a man and curse like a man and, man, and they felt liberated. And this is just sort of like on the heels of the suffragette movement. So it's very close to when women wanted to be released from their domestic roles. So the mafia was to thank for that. So then prohibition ends and then the next thing that happens is a lot of politicians and law enforcement officers who had their hands out throughout Prohibition, who were being bribed by the mafia, they still had their hands out for the next payday. And all of a sudden, the stock market crashes. So the market crashes and the banks tighten credit and they're not lending. So who do you go to for a loan? A lot of times the local mafioso was able to provide small business loans to people. And they would say in return, well, gee, I want a, I want a piece of the business. And the person being desperate for money, being desperate to feed their own family in a legitimate way, would take on this mafioso as a partner in their small business or sometimes bigger businesses. And that's how the mafia began after Prohibition to start to all of a sudden branch out into a lot of the industries that they would control for the next five or six decades. And some of them are still ensconced in today, a lot of these industries. And that was sort of like, again, an accident of fate where on the heels of Prohibition, they're cash heavy, the mafia, and that's and then the stock market crash causes the banks to close down all of their cash loans. But who's got the cash? The mobsters. And they wanted to invest. And then they started to open casinos. A lot of times when people wanted to gamble, you know, now we go to any gas station in America, we could buy $100 worth of scratch off tickets, we could bet lotto, uh, we could have casinos everywhere. But the mafia was providing gambling for people when they had no place to gamble. So a lot of people who wanted to gamble, um, you know, I have people in my family. My grandmother was a gambler. My aunts were gamblers. It's not just, a, you know, a tough male thing to gamble. A lot of women like to gamble. They had nowhere to gamble. The mafia was providing them a place to gamble. So they became through, I guess, elements of the government's lockdown or uh, negligent of the people's needs. The mafia would fill that vacuum and became something that they never expected to become. And through that, they bought off a lot of politicians and they kept the law away from them for a long time until volume two, which is a major change in attitude toward the mafia. And I get deeply into that in volume two, when Robert F. Kennedy becomes U.S. Attorney General under his brother, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Mm. It's a fascinating story. The first book is called Borgato, Rise of Empire, A History of the American Mafia. I understand that your second book is coming out in January. Will you come back on the program and talk to us about that book when it comes out? I would love to, Pete. I'll talk to you anytime. You're one of my favorite guys. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of glad to hear that. <laughs> I'm I'm Great. still I'm still quite afraid of you. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore, Peter. <laughs> Louis, I, I thank you very much for being on the program with us this time around. Looking forward to talking to you back in uh, in the new year. Thank you. Likewise, absolute pleasure, Peter, and uh, and uh, I look forward to coming back. Louis Ferrante, author of Borgata, Rise of Empire, A History of the American Mafia. You can go to our website at thestufffile.com to the page for this show, which is show number 0798, and you'll find links to Lewis's site, plus links to either Amazon.com or Amazon.ca, where you can order his book directly. You've just heard an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. To hear any or all of the full hour-long shows, visit thestufffile.com. Stuff is spelled S-T-U-P-H. That's thestufffile.com. A presentation of Flying Fish Communications.